Well, and welcome to another episode of the Photography Podcast. This is season four, episode two. Uh, there's five of us here this week. Um, we've had some issues. I'm not going to lie. We've had some <laughs> issues, guys. Um, but we've got we've got a special guest here this week. Um, Dave and, uh, and Darren aren't here, unfortunately, but hopefully they'll be back next week. Uh, but we've got a special guest to replace them. I think he's worth two of them, I reckon, don't you? It's Mark Littlejohn's here. Hello, Mark. How are you? Good evening. <laughs> There you go. We've just spent, come on, let's be honest, we've just spent 10 minutes with Mark going, and then Sam going, can, I, can anyone see me? Can anyone? So it's been, it's, been, it's been fun already. It's been fun. Anyway, um, what are we going to talk about? Let's uh, let's start with what's everyone been up to. So has anyone done anything exciting in the last couple of weeks that they want to share? <laughs> I've got a dog. I've no. got a dog. You got a dog? Yeah, I got a dog. Yeah, oh, I got a dog. Yeah. I'd fetch him down, but he's he's probably settling at the minute. So. Was it by accident yeah. or, or <laughs> he you just know. failed to scrape? <laughs> no, 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 no. Me, uh, my sister-in-law's uh, lab had a, a litter of about seven or eight, I think, and uh, we'd we'd, <laughs> we'd always said that we were going to get one at some point, but as things have kind of gotten a little easier with my son at home. Um, we thought now's the sort of right time. We, we couldn't have had one years ago with him; it would have been too too much work. But um, but yeah, no, we got uh, a red fox lab. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's a good lad though. He seems to be settling well, and the you know labs are pretty easy to train. I think yeah. from memory. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's been fun. That's been fun. Ah, oh, cool. Is this specifically to use in videos? So you can come out, oh, look, here's me with my dog because I'm a photographer. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. I mean, think, <laughs> think of the subs you'll gain if you take your dog out. What, what's, what's your dog's name? Uh, Cli- well, I wasn't aware of it. Well, it's called Clifford. <laughs> Clifford. Oh, Clifford. Oh, Clifford. Big, yeah. big no, no, no. Yes, no, no. well, yeah. Apparently this is a cartoon <laughs> called Clifford the Big Red Dog and the, my yeah. sister-in-law had been calling it Clifford. Um, because it was the biggest one of the, the litter. So uh, so anyway, we stuck with that. So he's, he's getting Cliff most of the time, so it'll probably be Cliff oh, going okay. forward. But Clifford when he's bad well, anyway. So. Congratulations. Oh. What? Well, Sorry, no, I missed the job. Mind. Never mind, never mind. Uh, <laughs> Cliff, Cliff, you know Cliff. Saying Cliff. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> someone will, got someone will get that somewhere yeah, along the way. Oh, the jo- oh, Cliff Richard. Yeah, Cliff. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. There you go, yeah. Is there a delay on the line, or is it just Gary's humour? It's just like, no, it's (laughs) delay from the 70s, mate. (laughs) Anyone else? Has anyone else done anything exciting? Mark, what have you been up to? Have you been up to anything exciting? Absolutely, bugger all. What day is it? Sunday. Saturday. (laughs) Saturday. Saturday. Home for a week. I had about five workshop weeks out of six. So basically, um, really not done a lot. Just catch up with jobs around the house, the uh, new floor in the living room, bit of decorating, and really just uh, just re- just recovering after four four weeks in a row. I never I never do back to back workshop weeks, but I did four back to back, which is I only take three people, but I do all the catering. So you know, you you're there for breakfast. Maybe not so much do the packed lunches now, but as soon as you come in, I've got the tea on, uh, and then we sort of eat, drink, and be merry, and then go out and repeat. But it can be tired <laughs> once you've been all day, and then you're cooking and doing whatever and tidying up. But, I mean, most of the groups have been great. They, they help out and tidy up and pour gin and all that sort of carry on. So do you normally book a holiday cottage for that kind of thing, Mark? Or? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I always um, I tend to book nice houses, so I only take three people, which is me and three people in the car. So it's four bedroom houses. Minimum of two bathrooms, uh, usually somewhere nice. Um, Glencoe again the week after. Next, that's an absolutely beautiful house on the shores of Loch Linney, just round from Balhulish. Uh, house last week was on Luskintyre. Um, two weeks in Glencoe, and then where the friggin' hell else was it? I was at Strathconnan for a week. There was another week. Where was it? Where the flu my neck was I? It wasn't terrible. <laughs> I had no idea where I was four weeks ago. None. 
That's but was there a lot? Was there a lot of gin that week? Yeah, the week in Harris there was a lot of gin. It was uh, some brand new lads that I me, mean, Mrs. Collins, <laughs> put blinders, um, because they just like a, a drink. I said to the boys, I said, "Look, I said, we've got six bottles of red in the car, and we've got a couple of bottles of whiskey. We don't need anything else." So went in the store and we caught to get some food. I said, "We don't need any more drink, okay?" So they came back with twelve bottles of red uh, and a couple of bottles of gin. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Lovely guys. L- lovely guys. Every horizon totally on the piss throughout the whole <laughs> workshop. Yeah. Everyone just, just, just gone. Uh, <laughs> we, we, went to, uh, we went to Balakush, Gary, didn't we? What was it, Balakush? Uh, early, early morning, looking for something. Uh, the, the, the garages didn't open early enough to sell blower back. No, that's no, that Fort William. Yeah, but that was Balakush yeah, as well. I think we stopped Bal- it. Balahulish. Yeah. Balahulish. Balahulish. Oh, right. Okay. Balahulish. Was, that, was that that lake? With, was that yeah, that, that that's lock it. With the reflections. Was Not that, a lake, a lock. With the, br- yeah. with the bridge. That's the one. Yeah. 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 The, the sea lock, isn't it? Is that, is, yeah. that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The, the bridge at Balahulish, you've got to uh, yeah. lock through them going into Loch Linney and whatever. But yeah, you can't, you can't buy a drink in yeah, Scotland before right. 10 o'clock in the morning. If you, if you want a drink, you just go with the Birmingham boys. They didn't buy 18 bottles of. Wine, four bottles of gin, two bottles of whiskey in a week. <laughs> well, we had we had an issue last time because my bed, my uh, blow up bed got a leak, um, and so we ended up. Uh, we, we drove miles. We drove all the way up to Fort William to get an airbed, and then when we drove back, we realised that the petrol station right next to where we're camping sold airbeds. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so that was that was fun. Um, everyone really appreciated that. That was your car, actually, Sam, wasn't it? We went in your car, so yeah, we, we used your petrol on that one, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Jamie, what have you been up to? Anything? I saw you <coughs> put a video out, a video or two? Uh, last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went down to, uh, down to the Fen. Yeah, it was all right, actually. Got some, well, you were meant to be there with me, of course, but lazy side as you normally are, staying in bed. <laughs> Now I had a rumour that the uh, that the middle bit was going to be shut off. Oh, of so course you come. did. Yeah. Oh, they they weren't yeah. happy. <clears throat> they weren't happy. There was four of them rocked up there. They wanted to go in the middle bit. Deer closed for deer management. Poor deer. You know, just they're just roaming around doing nothing. They're going to get shot. So couldn't go in. So yeah, we went went on to the uh, the top bit, which is uh, lesser well known, but it was where I was going to go anyway. I love the chaos of the place. It was brilliant. So yeah, enjoyed it. Nice morning. Oh, excellent, Sam. You had a you you've been up to stuff. Eh? You've had a yeah. video out, haven't you? As well. Yeah, I put well, I put a video out. I've had a few videos out recently. But I put a video out last weekend. So I was had a really nice morning down in Glen Affick because um, I really wanted to make it down to Glen Affick for autumn. And this autumn has just been out of this world. To be honest, it's just been an incredible autumn up here. Um, and not only that, but luckily for me. I actually had mist and nice autumn conditions coinciding with a weekend. So I was actually able to go out and, and photograph it. So yeah, we had a, had an absolutely stunning morning down there in Glen Affick. Um, and then was it last weekend or weekend before was, was quite nice as well. We had a, we had a bit of mist here in Torridon as well. So I was over at, um, uh, maybe Mark can correct my pronunciation, the Cowlin estate over by Loch Clare. Um, so I was over there Coolie. last last week. Is yeah, it, is it Loch, Coolin? Coolin. Right, Coolin. Cowlin. Cowlin. Okay. So it, yep. Yeah, Cowlin is um, how you pronounce it. I know it doesn't spell like that, but that, it's Cowlin. Beautiful spot. Yeah. Well, you're in, you're in Scotland, so nothing nothing is pronounced that it's spelled the <laughs> same as Wales and East Anglia, by the way. So, yeah, that's <laughs> the worst one. <clears throat> Ever go to East Anglia? I mean, Jesus. Well, what's yeah. that place called? C- you- There's a place called C O S T E S S E Y. What's that? What's that? Don't say anything, Jamie. What would you call that? C O S T E S S E Y. What would you call that? Go on, if you read that. Well, I would read that as Costasy. Yeah. 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 Right. They called yeah. it Cossy. <clears throat> Well, it's the same as the same as Happisburg Lighthouse. Happisburg, yeah, yeah, yeah. Happisburg, yeah, which is Haysborough. It's Haysborough. Ridiculous, yeah. ridiculous, stupid, stupid uh, six-fingered people. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> I was going to say anyway, we've got to count uh, the letters on their uh, fingers. We... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, do you, do, do you two live quite close to each other, Sam and, and Mark? Yeah, not that far. I don't know where Sam. Um, where do you live, yeah. Sam? Uh, 
I live in uh, Akhnashella. So between Akhnashin oh, okay. and Loch Cowan. Yeah. yeah, no, no. I, I, I like going across the railway then, going up um, okay. Loch Gorge. Because it means the back and back going to the county yep. estate. All oh, right, no, it's a great little spot there. Yeah, yeah. It's stunning and, down and, here, and, yeah. And so. I've not really seen, I mean, I love that bit when you cross the railway line and then hang a left and go up the back of Well 4 or whatever you call it and, and in there. That's beautiful up in there. Yeah. Really yeah. lovely. Just that little bit of ancient woodland where the, the stream comes down. Love it. In the winter yeah, as well. Yeah, no, really exactly. nice uh, snowy morning up there. You got, yeah. um, is, it, is it Joe White's got the the, the old butchers in Loch Cairn as well, the little cafe now? That's it, yeah. Yeah, nice yeah. Um, I bump, bumped into him actually last time I was out photographing. We were both over at the same same place over in Torridon and bump, bumped into him. So it's quite yeah. nice to sort of catch up with him a bit. But yeah, definitely. Oh, Joe stop White. For a I know coffee. Joe White from Yorkshire. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. Oh, I didn't know he was up there. Oh, he's good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe White. Oh, nice him and his missus have um, bought a little cafe. Really nice. A few prints up in the walls. Uh, uh, and Loch Cairn, worth worth, worth uh, going in. That's nice. Yep. Uh, okay. okay, good photographer. Good photographer. He is, a good is, is he? Is he a runner? He's a runner. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've, I've run into him on Twitter. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say, you don't run into him literally, yeah. have you? <laughs> no, well, no, I don't do any running. I'm sure he's lovely. <laughs> I'm sure he's lovely offline. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, oh dear. Um, so let, let's do a little bit of admin before we carry on uh, with the rest of the podcast. Uh, the photo comp, uh, I don't know how many entries we've had. I'm assuming we've had some, but Dave's not here uh, to let us know. But um, please still, you know, keep getting your entries in. You've got over two weeks left to go and we'd love to. Mark, do you fancy entering anything into the photo comp? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think you just woke up slightly there. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you're more than welcome to. Uh, if you do, then then we'll probably be releasing a calendar. If you don't, then we'll, we'll probably leave it. Uh, not saying that everyone else's won't be any good. I'm sure they'll be really good as well uh, before we go any further. Uh, but yeah, you've still got time to enter two, two entries per person unless you're Mark and he can put in 12. Um, right. Uh, what else have we got? <laughs> um, so... Oh yeah! Thanks very much for the new subs. We've had we've had forty odd new subscribers this week. Really? Um, with yeah, yeah. Um, we, had, we had a lot of views on the last video as well. Uh, I think it was probably because of Stuart's rant on uh, on uh, landscape photography of the year. So, you know, we might do a bit more of that. You never know. Um, today, um, yeah, we've had quite a few new subs. That's really good. Um, going to go through the comments really, really quickly. Um, one person, one very sad and deluded person on the comments, like Darren's chair. Mm. Mm. yeah did you yeah, just, just see one. that yeah, yeah yeah just the one but yeah poor man um there was a consensus really on camera clubs although a few people did say that um there are some progressive camera clubs out there so we'll have to look out for those but um and there's one other which 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 was a weird one someone sent a message who's obviously obviously not watched the podcast before said the guy in the gray which was me looked like peter green Right, and I was really offended because I was like, I do not look like that bloke or family guy. Right? And then I realised that's Peter Griffin. But then I looked at <laughs> then I looked at <laughs> but, but then I looked at Peter Green, who was in Pink Floyd and he's now dead, and he's just as bad. He's a ugly bloke, man. I was like, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Anyway. Um yeah, so that's, that's out of the way. Anyway, let's get on to uh, let's get on to some topics, shall we? So, oh god, last week we talked a lot about landscapes, or two weeks ago we talked a lot about landscape photography of the year, mm. and there's been a few little updates on that, hasn't there, Stuart? Uh, just a few, just a few. Yeah, no. Do you want to do, do, do you want to no, share? Attention. Because <laughs> I, I mean, I've read some stuff. Andy Gray's. Uh, yeah post as well as yours but bloody hell so yeah i thought, I, I, I had a little think of, i don't often sort of write uh blogs and stuff like that but um i had a little think about things after you know what had happened and you know i mean it's important to keep these things in context no one died or anything it's you know it's a photography competition but 
Um, but yeah, I thought now nah, I'm gonna gonna put something down. I, I had a couple of drafts writing it actually because um, I think the first couple of drafts were were pretty um, ranty, sweary. yeah, sweary, ranty, well, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Um, and by the time I got to the third one, I'd actually sort of measured it a bit better, and um, I didn't want to put things in it that were sort of subjective. Um, I wanted to just sort of stick to the facts of, of what was there. So, uh, so yeah, I put a few thoughts down and uh, put it uh, out there. And uh, it it went a bit sort of nuts on Twitter. Um, mm. Not so much on other platforms, but uh, those things tend to sort of uh, go like that on Twitter a little bit. Um, but what's what's been interesting since putting it out is just how many other people had issues and um, you were saying there about Andy Gray, uh, for people who's watching this who don't know who Andy Gray is, Andy Gray is a fantastic photographer from the, from the North yeah, East um, who specialises in sort of ICM stuff. He's got a, I think he's got a YouTube channel, hasn't he? He does, um, yes. Yeah. yeah, and he's, his case was, you know, in some ways worse than mine, to be honest with you. Um, but... He's mine, whoever's, you know, the, the, it was just bad all around, basically. But then um, I think, Mark, you were in the, the comment thread where that woman had um, commented from the camera club and there was, an, there was another incident where someone had, someone had had some miscommunication and then... Um, yeah, that was a strange one because apparently your name was even read out during the... At the, the do, yeah. But then yeah. you're saying... Yeah. It's not actually highly commended, even though she's listed on the website, it's highly commended. So I, it's absolutely make, bonkers. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Any sense at all. Makes no sense. It, it smells, no, it smells to me like they're trying to sort of dig themselves a hole with it. Um, yeah, this woman basically had got, messaged me on uh, Twitter and said, oh, there's a lady at our camera club who's had some issues with the competition and having seen your blog, I've gone to her to remind her just to maybe have a quick check um, to see if there was actually a mistake. And it, as Mark's saying there, this lady actually was highly commended on the website. Her a picture, I believe, was read out at the awards evening. But then when she's actually got in touch with the competition to say, look, you know, what's gone on here? They've actually told her that that was a mistake, that her image was read out at the awards due. And she's not actually been commended at all. But if you go to the website, she's still listed as highly commended in the black and white category. So there's just an absolute catalogue of errors here. That, um, to be honest, I, I just think there needs to be some sort of level of accountability with this. Um, you know, people are forking over a lot of money. A lot of money is being made. And, you know, they, these things have been kind of going on for a long time, but I think a lot of people have just kind of held the tongue with it because, you know, f for varying different reasons. But my my guess is that people don't really say anything because they're frightened that they might get blacklisted or something off this competition. So it's kind of sailed along for a lot of years and these errors have kept happening. And then this year has been just so bad that I think, you know, it, if, if I didn't say it, I would hope someone else would have said it, to be honest. But, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's all... Well, I mean, uh, yeah. Accountability for me is, is is the thing because, like you say, you're paying minimum 25 quid, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, okay, so if you pay 25 quid and you don't get selected, then fine. But you, you put it in. But if you pay 25 quid, you expect a level of service, whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you expect to be told if you're in... I mean, the Andy Gray one, for people who don't know, he got two images. Were they highly commended? One one commended? highly commended and one commended. And and neither of them were in the book. Neither of them made it into the book. And there were only four images that didn't make it into the book and two of them were his. That's mm. a joke. That's ridiculous. We don't know how many images were commended that didn't go in the book. Unless somebody goes through... Yeah, four. I mean, it. Unless somebody goes through yeah. it, which is on the website... And then ticks it off against the copy. Yeah. Of the, you don't know what the situation is. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah. Andy. Andy said. Andy said four. He said there were four images that weren't commended in his blog, and two of them were his. Yeah, but so, they're the they're the only ones that he knew about. 
The, this oh, okay, so they may uh, be. Okay, yeah, so that lady that got in touch me, with me, her her my image might not be in the book either. So. <laughs> it's not my thing, surely, just to, to have your list of commended images, your list of highly commended images, your runner-ups, your winners, and then just cross-check them against the spreadsheet, the book. I mean, you've got to plan it's, the it's, book. Yeah. I mean, surely, surely somebody sits and plans the book. And I don't know it would be a twain year. You think... Yeah. You say if you pay between twenty five and thirty five pounds, you're paying for a service. You're not just paying to enter competition. You're paying for a service. You're paying for some sort of efficiency. Absolutely. You want some transparency as to where that money has gone. I think certainly if I were involved in a competition like this, I think transparency of where the money is going, how much profit's been made, mm-hmm. uh, who gets paid what sums of money. Um, I think that's the sort of thing. Because the thing I've yeah. I've read into in Twitter is the fact that people aren't happy about the fact that they perceive it as perhaps being a cash cow for for somebody. Most competitions, so it's a case of, I think, if you're running a competition like this, I think one of the important things to regain the trust of the people that are entering is complete transparency with the funds, uh, how much money is being made. Uh, If you're going to start up a competition, I think it should definitely be completely free from profit if any profit was to be made. It should go to somebody, some you know, nature, for, nature first. Somebody, somebody that's actually looking at maintaining uh, the landscape, as opposed to being a competition run for profit of one individual or a company or whatever else. Um, that's my feelings on the subject because it's yeah. not just the fact that people feel it's inefficient. People, when you read the comments on Twitter, are unhappy about the money side of things. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who does run it? Is it Light and Land? Or, or I don't know too much about it, if I'm honest. It was a genuine question. Who who actually is owning that competition? Is it, is it one person? Is it a body of people? Or I'm not sure. You don't, but Charlie you Waite owns it, doesn't he? Sorry? That's Charlie it. Waite owns it, doesn't he? he? I don't know how much ownership. You'd, you'd need to look into how many different companies are involved because obviously you have take a view... You have Lightworks, you have Light and Land, you have various bodies, various entities. Um, so we'd be surmised as to who actually owned it and who made the biggest profit from it. Um, need to have a look into that. Somebody's making a lot of money out of it, though, that's for sure, because you think how many entries there are. At 25 quid for, was it eight? That's a lot of money going into it. Well, it's thir- 35 quid for, 35 for 20. Is it thirty? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it, it, it's it's going to be a, a sum of money, but there will be expenses. So hmm. it's not a case I, I, I wouldn't get carried away and say it was. I mean, there's been huge sums of money mentioned, but I don't think it would be huge sums of money. Um, but like I say, I think any any competition when you've got the current Ferrari, it needs to be transparent about how much money's come in, how much money's gone out, how much money's gone in prize money. I mean, that was the thing that struck me was it's Stuart. Stuart Sayer is the overall runner-up, and he's got nothing. He's not even got a refund on his cash. He's not even got a... <laughs> a pat on the back. Yeah. Aye. A pat on the back would be nice. Yeah, what you're saying about prizes, though, I, 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 I too think that they're kind of... That I don't think they're making, like, exorbitant money, but what I think is a particularly bad look with this competition now is that if you look at the size of the book... So the book used to be, I don't know, um, I think that I'd seen a figure and it was used to be about 120 images and it's been scaled back now to under under 90. So that book is about 25% or whatever, smaller than it used to be. Now, if you're doing big print runs, that's a significant cost that you're saving, basically. I know print costs will have gone up, but obviously entry fees and everything will have risen accordingly as well. So the, if you look at how many images are actually getting put through in this competition now, it's a lot less than it used to be. So they're making a saving there. The exhibition has always been done on the cheap since they moved it from the National Theatre. Well, Mark, when um, when he won it, it was it was back at the National Theatre and it was all no, presented was, properly. It, we, and, we, we went to a with us oh, was you, on the edge of it. Oh, were, uh, were, were, were you the first... Oh, you were the first year it moved then, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the um, 
they've scaled all that back. You know, the presentation of it has has gone right back. They they Mark said there he had it in a they had it in a weather spoons. When I when, when I went down in 2018, it was it's probably the same spot. It was like a sports bar on a yeah. train country, and it was already felt yeah felt then like they were doing it on the cheap. And um, mm. and then even since then, they're now, from what I can gather, doing it through the what looks like the conference room in the in the publishers. So they're getting the the exhibition dirt cheap because Network Rail sponsor it. So that would be costing exactly. them nothing. Um, the book that they produce, you know, yeah, there's a co- there's a fixed cost there, but you know, they'll, they'll be making more than enough um, in sales of it. Um, so when I look at the actual sort of costs that they have going out the door other than paying judges, which by the looks of things, I don't know if they're actually paying them that much. They don't really have a lot of a lot of costs there, to be honest, uh, versus what's coming in. I wouldn't have thought the judges would be getting paid. The judges would be more likely to get their expenses paid. Um, so well, yeah, a, well, yeah, even worse. Yeah, I mean, I was, when I did the, the European wildlife thing um, this year, it was your expenses were met, that was it. But the the scaling back the whole thing. Well, I've just I've just looked at one of the old books there, book seven, and it was like two hundred twenty four pages, and it's a nice solid book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not now. It's a small, small, piddly little thing now, isn't it? It's about probably half that. We don't know. You not got one. I don't know. I know. <laughs> I can you believe that, man? <laughs> yeah, still haven't got one. I'm not chasing them. I'm not chasing them. Do you think essentially that they need a kick at the arse? They need a kick up the arse, don't they? Yeah, they but I, I, this, they need... I've done the kick up the arse yeah. kicking on Twitter. They've got absolutely panned yeah. over this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, I've had nothing from them. I, I got an email, uh, bo- not to me, just a bog standard email saying about the book and the publisher will be in contact with you. And if they're not, here's a contact. And I thought, hang on a sec. You lot should be making sure absolutely everyone gets their book on time. It's not up to me mm. to go chasing you for a book, you know what I mean? It, it, that's I'm not going to do that. I'd rather not have one. But yeah, here we are, what, nearly a month later, no book for Runner Up. So, so apart, you know I mean? apart from that apart from that email then, you've heard no no sort of formal response back. And obviously everybody on Twitter has been tagging El Potty, so they, they, know, they know about the noise, yeah? Right, I should clear this up here because I have had a few comments like this. And I did put this in the in the blog actually that I have spoken to a person from El Potty in person on the phone very apologetic very cordial and I've absolutely no issue with that person whatsoever um, I had a very sort of civil frank com- conversation with them and he shared a lot of the same frustrations I had so I've, my issue I mean I'm kind of reiterating what I put in the blog here but for people who haven't read it I suppose it's, I should say this is that the most disappointing part of this for me is that if you're running any kind of organisation as high profile as this and you're making errors like this, it's up to the person at the top to be doing the grovelling and the apologies because if you fail, you fail as a group. You shouldn't be putting one person. And now I don't know if this person was told to get in contact with me or they did it in their own, their own volition. But that person shouldn't be hung out to dry and everything put on their head. If yeah. if the errors that have happened with this competition that they have, it's because the systems behind it in place are not adequate and up to scratch. And that's the person at the top who's responsible for that for me. And they should be one, the, the one carrying the can for this. It's not that person who I spoke to on the phone. I've got every sympathy for that guy. But for me, it looks like just... Uh, I mean, we're all guessing a little bit, but it feels to me like it's it's done on the cheap in the background. The resource is probably scaled back. And these kind of errors that are just basic admin errors, ultimately, they're, they're just like Mark saying there. I mean, how hard is it to have a spreadsheet and just check people off? Yeah. These are the kind of errors that ends – they're inevitable when when companies start cutting corners and it feels like there's just a lot of cut, corner cutting – basically. But um, that was the most disappointing thing for me, because if it had been me in that position, I would have been the first person on the phone groveling to them in person. Um, I wouldn't be doing you what's happening now, you which... You don't need to be groveling. You just need to be up front and say, I apologise for this. 
uh, my company, it's down to me. Well, I'm, pa- I'm paraphrasing gro- groveling, yeah. obviously, but yeah, you know what I mean, we'd, though. We'd expect some sort of statement because the thing I, I've always liked about El Potty is the sense of community it brings to the photographic um, community, basically. It's like, you know, when you, when you get up towards the, the t- when, when, when it's announced uh, and people would be wondering who it's going to be, the winner would be announced, there'd be a lot of people congratulating, people would be sharing other images they've seen because everybody's got a favourite image, so people would share it. And, and there'd be a, a real sense of togetherness, there'd be a real sense of pride in the achievements of others. It, you don't need to just be pride, proud of your own achievements, you can be proud that it's one of your friends that's come forward yeah. and maybe won the classic or anything else. And that real sense of community is, is in danger of, of being soured permanently by what's happened this year uh, and and that's it's almost with with sadness it's not it's more it's as much sadness with as anger because i don't enter anymore i haven't entered for a number of years yeah but i still like to look at it i still like to see friends people i admire uh coming forward winning prizes everybody having a really positive nice chat when you see an image that is from somewhere you've never seen before it's just a little hidden corner that just yeah it's been done magically. It's been beautifully presented, and you just feel a sense of joy looking through it, and you feel a sense of warmth. Instead, this year it really is a sense of disappointment and sadness, um, and that's on the outside looking in. And for people such as yourself, who's been the overall runner-up and received nothing, not even a copy of the book, then I think you're entitled to feel anger as well as that sadness and disappointment. It's something that's always been superb, really not delivering this year. Yeah. yeah, I mean personally, I, I'm bitter at it every year. <laughs> um, you just bitter full stop. You just bitter, bitter anyway. full stop. But every year, I'm bitter when I get my email back to say, "No, you've got nothing this year again, you useless bastard." So um, that kind of you know feels a, a little bit bad for me. But no, I mean for you, you serial winners, you know, sitting amongst us, who'd have thought when we started the podcast, Jamie, <laughs> yeah. that we would be sat here amongst serial winners? Who would have thought? You Rather know? than serial killers. Yeah. They're probably <laughs> thinking, who would have thought when we were serial winners we'd be sat on a podcast? <laughs> yeah. but there you go. Um, yeah. Sam, Sam, you haven't said a lot. Um, what do you want to say, mate, about it? It's, well, it's probably because I'm on about a 50-second delay at the moment, aren't I? Can you... Can you can hear you now. You can hear. Sorry, I Sam, what? Am I Sorry. Right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. I'm. I'm just. I'm just trying to take over Dave. No, fine, okay. Dave. Dave's role for, for this week. Um, yeah. I, well, just just agree with everything everyone's already said. The only other thing I'd, I'd say is that with with regards to. So I'm quite surprised to hear that people with highly commended images are not having those in the book because I would have thought things like the book would be planned out before you even start the competition. You know how many people are going to be. I mean, I'm. I might be wrong, but I assume you know how many photographs are going to be commended, how many will be highly commended, how many winners and runners-up there'll be. And all of those images should be in the book. So you should know that there's, I don't know, X number of images which are going to be in the book. Um, yeah. And mm. that's just how it should work. They should all be in the book. So unless it's... It, that's it, always it been the case. That's yeah, always been just, the case. I, I just don't understand how you can mess that up. You've got to set the book out. You've got to decide how many pages it's going to be. It, it's it's a cost. Yeah. It's got to mm. so it's got to be properly designed. Yeah. It's got to be properly thought out. Mm. Yeah, maybe they thought this year. Maybe Sam, they thought this year we've got to spare at least a couple of pages for coloured walls. <laughs> There's not going to be enough room God. to get in a good shot of uh, of the Sycamore Gap. Mark, maybe, is it? Maybe, maybe yeah. I thought that. He's on about that pic. You know them three pictures that I sent you that were all the same picture? The same picture been in about three years. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. the same picture, yeah. Well, there's a few other examples like that. That's the other thing. I mean, you were saying about it feels like this year. I, I mean, I've felt for quite a few years it's been kind of going down the pan a bit. With the, the, I, I deliberately left out of the blog stuff about judging because, you know, you can you can – have your own opinions about judging and stuff, but ultimately it ends up being subjective. But what isn't subjective is putting the same images repeatedly through year after year after year. That's that's not a like a subjective thing. That's that's just yeah. you know incompetent almost. And and it's something that we talk about as photographers. 
is the impact that our football has on areas. So to keep awarding the same images um, is really against what we're talking about. Can you imagine how muddy that pavement's going to be outside that, <laughs> outside that wall? It's going to be churned up, that pavement. <laughs> the buses aren't going to be out of stop. It's going to be a nightmare for it. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 we've, we've discussed it before on the channel, so I won't go down that road again, but... Um, Oh it, no! Just do it. We're good at regurgitating. Well, I, I, I was well, I was going to bring up the Scottish landscape photography competition um, because they they went kind of the opposite. I, I, I only mentioning it in in reference to the point about it being a location competition because they went the opposite way and said like we're not going to accept any photographs of Luskintyre. We're not going to accept any photographs of Glencoe, um, which arguably is a bit extreme. But it just sort of highlights that I think you know in some ways maybe that's too far to go but in terms of there's a middle ground have, isn't there yeah there's a middle ground you know you don't always have to have the same photograph of the same location in the competition every year another photograph of whatever hill in the snow again you know it's it, there, there's a middle ground and a balance but it, equally there, there should also be a, a way for competitions to to maybe promote that element of trying to not create a, a honey pot too much out of one particular location by promoting it so much every year because that that's what leads to to damage in the end yeah. you, you'd have thought as well though that, that that there might be i know there's a panel of judges and some of them might they might rotate each year or be slightly different but you might have thought there'd be someone or, or a number of people on there who would look and go yeah, this one did really well last year. This check, top checking. did really well yeah. last year. Yeah, maybe we should just not check. give that. Yeah, exactly. Just, just have a and not give that it's same that person. That, yeah, exactly. That happened. So, that happened, that happened you know. European wildlife. When I, there was somebody behind us as we were looking at images and they would say, oh, right, this is an image that was awarded last year and it was an identical image. So it was like, yeah, yeah. off to one side. Straight out, yeah. But they, yeah. That, was, yeah. that was the person who wasn't a judge. They were just looking at these other images and saying no bang no but they spotted it and that's the main thing isn't it that's what you want that's what you're paying your entry fee for you expect that that's going to happen yeah so essentially uh, an organisation that's organised you know mm. so yeah. to sum summarise that whole conversation <laughs> Don't enter next year. That's, that's what Stuart's saying. Stuart is literally summarised that by saying, "Don't enter next year. Don't give them your money. It's it's not worth it." That's what Stuart was saying there, essentially. Um, time for a new competition. Yeah, it's time for a, time new, competition, for a new competition, Stuart competition. Mark. Yep. You know, you know, <laughs> just just put it out there. But I did see, I did see that Nigel Danson comment uh, mentioned that he might bring back his competition next year, and to be fair. That one, the money went. There was no profit made out of that, was there? That the money, all the money from that competition, I believe, did go to charity or mm. or some sort of good cause. So yeah, yeah. you know, maybe maybe that's well, not me and, a bad one. Me and Mark have both judged on that competition, and it's yeah, yeah it's done done very. It's it's run yeah. run as you'd expect it. To, you know, yeah. as a proper. Did you have to judge yeah. it on seven categories, like seven different? Was it you know what? Oh gosh, <laughs> I got yeah, it that time. Yeah. I got yeah, it. One of my jokes, someone got brilliant. I got it. I got it. Yeah, doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that. That joke. Um, anyway, moving on. Moving on. Uh, does any? Oh, before we move on any further, actually, Stuart, I got got something to say to you. Congratulations for having an issue with your Coke, your Coke Zero bottle. Was saying you feel my pain now. I do. Yeah? That was a. Pain in the ass, that yeah, yeah. I did. See, yeah. You see where that come from now, and I several agree. people in the comments agreed with me as well. I agree. They had issues with yeah. it. Not yeah. so many for the Alpro, um, Sam, uh, well. or the oat milk, uh, or the almond milk, but um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, lots of people were saying the same as me. So, does anybody want to get anything off their chest this week? I I've, I've got nothing this week, but if anyone, Mark, if you've got something you want to get off your chest, it could be anything at all. Any, you know, oh God, related, anything. So feel free. <laughs> Or we can wait till you've had another whiskey. It's up to you. <laughs> you don't want me to start, lad. We'll be, we'll be here tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I'll just edit the best ones. I'll pick the. I'll just cherry pick the best ones out. Now, if you've got anything you want to get off your chest, go what? for it now. This is your opportunity. Anybody. I like, I like, I like, 
I'd like the I think the idea of talking about the uh, going to the locations you were saying that's what we're going to talk about next. Yeah, that's coming up. Well, good. For, for, Gary, before you do that, I don't want to go for the chest, but can I, can I ask Mark a question? Mark, go what goes through your head when you write your spiels? What <laughs> you, you just just completely Nothing. random stuff? What <laughs> goes in your what goes through your mind? It's like first thing that it's like an antelope running across the bloody prairie. It doesn't have a clue where it's going. It's just like. That's... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, somebody said to me, I don't, I don't know really read the spiels all the way through, but I, I read them all the way through. I think I don't read them all the way through, and I'm writing the fucking things. <laughs> <laughs> and do you really Christ. have to get get Mrs. LJ to sign them off before you publish them? Is that right? Well, let's see that, but I mean, because she doesn't, she doesn't do Facebook. <laughs> doesn't do social media oh, at all. Okay. I, know, I do read them just to, it's like a, a little sort of um, test just in case the neighbours say, oh, because we're in the pub the other week and I've been writing the spiels when I was away, so obviously I wasn't telling Rach the spiels. So I've been writing the spiels when I was away. So on Friday night, I was back from the workshop on Harris, straight into the Banner Crow Inn with the neighbours. So the six of us all having a beer and a pizza and just having a good laugh. And then one of the other couples were like having a real laugh about, I'd done a spiel about long, uh, high toilets. So they all started pissing themselves laughing about tall toilets. And my missus is looking at something to say, what the freaking hell are you all talking about? And they're saying, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they're sitting on this toilet and they didn't even touch the ground. And my missus is like, what? Eh? So, yeah, they're just... <laughs> Just, they are what they are. I mean, I'm toilets. Oh, yeah, honestly, I, I found out afterwards it was a disabled toilet because it was it was it was a room on the ground floor. <laughs> so they had this toilet, and I don't know if you've got dodgy hips or whatever else, you, you get a, a higher toilet. I I don't think that's a great idea, but I realised it was a disabled toilet when I looked in the mirrors and brushed my teeth, and all I could see was me groin because the mirror was like wheelchair. <laughs> It wasn't really a dazzling smile that I saw reflected in the mirror, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the spews are oh, brilliant. Sometimes I have an idea and I'll make a little note and a write. But sometimes it's the first thing that comes into my head. Sometimes they take five minutes, sometimes they take 20 minutes. Um, it's quite nice writing something sensible. I did. Um, Mark Bentley in Outdoor Photography gave me a shout to see if I would do an article for this month's Outdoor Photography because it was like the 300th. So that was nice to write something sensible, if you like, but trying to write it in the same way. Uh, I think I'm doing writing an article for an amateur photographer, which is, I think it's 1,400 words on processing and why we process and how I process. Um, so that'll be quite nice. That'll be a nice way to think about it. Um, and why you know because it's not just a case of how we process it's why we process you know why we do in the way we we, we do it i mean mine's is very much a, a, a self-taught uh open a bottle of whiskey and, and and have a bit of a fun it's not a case of like watching somebody who's technically proficient like stuart and how he does it on on youtube or, uh, I haven't even oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean it's it's so it's, it's, it's it, it's it's nice just to write something sensible occasionally, mm. very occasionally. Don't stop! Don't stop the spiels there, mate, because they're funny. They are really good. Seriously, especially ones about the toilet. When, when you good. process them, Mark, when when you process, is it is it a very fluid thing? Do you do it? Do you have a? I always find this fascinating. Do you have like a a set sort of I don't know certain things you do first, and then you get to a point, and then you do something else, or is it just like each image? You process in a different way. You don't have anything, because when I process my things, it's never set. I just, I just sit there and just do it. Do you know what I mean? I don't go. Oh, must drop the highlights. Must lift, you know all of that. I don't do that. I just do it. I just, I, I look at an image. I decide what I'm going to process, and it's always straight afterwards. Like I mean, yesterday it was an image uh, taken on the beach. Uh, the little camera. I came in. I processed it in about ten minutes. Um. Mm. 
And I just look at the thing, all right, what do I need to do this? And if, I might have an idea in my head as to what it is. It's always about enhancing that feeling, if you like, that we had when we took the pictures. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. really enhancing your perception, your the vision you've got inside your head. That's what you're trying to achieve. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's slightly unrealistic or if you know you're leaving reality a bit too far behind, or sometimes you're 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 sticking fairly close to what actually did happen. I don't have any hard and fast rules, uh, but it is usually fairly fluid. It's usually a couple of minutes. Um, that's pretty much it. I play with the split tones every time because I always play with the color uh, because that that's a big thing about how you you perceive things in your head. Color is a huge thing to me. It's not a case of you know, increasing the structure and bringing in radio filters and dodging and burning. It, it's mo- its just about the mood. Uh, I don't dodge and burn at all. Mm. Um, it's really, it's just very, very simple, but very personal. Um, and I suppose just the same way as a photograph. It's just, you photograph the little scenes, the things that um, you see when you're out and about. When you're processing an image for, say, you know, it's just a quick quick edit of, say, three, two or three minutes... Do you ever feel? Do you ever go back to those images again and tweak them, or is it if you're once you're done, you're just done? Oh no, yeah, no, I, can, I, can, I can go back because I look at an image and think, Jesus, fucking wet. Um, I mean, I, I had an image that, when you talk about, when you talk about Elf, I had an image that was in the book, and then it's a print on my mother's wall because she loved it, and I absolutely hate it, and I've reprocessed it since, and I find prefer, it, and it's totally different, and I've, I gave actually a print to Jason Hudson. Good lad. Uh, I gave a print to him. It's his, it's his housewarming because he's been a pal for 30 odd years. Um, and, and it's just, it's it's chalk and cheese to the original processing. Um, doesn't happen very often, but yeah, sometimes I go in and it's just totally different. But then again, your mood's different. How you, how you perceive an image is different because a year might have passed, two years might have passed. Mm. Um, you know, that's quite, and that's one of the reasons why I process an image straight away is because I know what I thought or what I felt when I took it. If I leave it a month or two months, and I've, I've no bloody idea. I'm, I'm, I'm just as likely to look at the picture and think, what on earth were you thinking? Um, which is, you know, the, we all do that. But I couldn't, you know, I read people saying, you know, I'm just going to sit down and process the images I took in Iceland in 1976. And I think, seriously? I mean, obviously I'm exaggerating slightly. <laughs> I mean, that's what some folk are like. They, they talk about, you know, I'm going to process images I took six months ago, and I'm thinking, what? Literally just today I was sat down so, going through photos from New Zealand, which I took about three years ago, which I just hadn't touched. I had a whole section of trips, <laughs> of photos from a particular trip, and I went through. <laughs> and it was like, because it, it was all handheld stuff from a boat trip as well. And I remember at the time thinking, I might get some really nice shots here, and I just never got around to looking at it. Um and I was looking through and I was thinking, what the hell was I photographing that for? And it was just a load of rubbish. Yeah. There'll, there'll have been something that you you thought, some small thing in your your brain that it made you think of something and that's why you took the picture. And three years later, it's like, oh, I've been yeah. in New Zealand. When did it go there? Well, at least that'd be me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, mean I, don't, I can't even remember where it was for. Well, you don't, rem- you don't remember what you did four weeks ago. No. <laughs> I've got to start. I know exactly where it was, I think. <laughs> that that's a good point though sam you know yep. like i think if you take that long to edit a photo maybe you're not that excited about the photo yeah mm. I, I mean personally when i go out if i take a photo i'm excited about i mm. can't wait to get back and edit it i want to edit it straight away i want to like all, you know even like there have been times when i've got up ridiculously early in the morning driven you know two hours Taken something, come back in the evening, totally knackered, but I've got to get it on the computer and edit it yep. because I'm excited about it. Whereas if I've just left it on the camera, probably not really that excited about the photo in the first place. You know? Yeah, actually, I tell you, that's one of the things which I would say is is YouTube getting in the way of is and and you know I, I I don't let it happen anymore. But this was a few years ago, and at the time, you know, I went to New Zealand and I I did three or four videos whilst I was out there. So when I got back from New Zealand, I focused on editing the photos which were going in the videos. And then there were trips I did, which obviously I didn't bother filming because life's too short. Um, and those some of those ones got forgotten about. So this this set of photos, which I, d- I just happened to look at it today because it I just noticed the folder on, on the hard drive. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if there's actually anything in there. 
And it's you, that is a classic case of YouTube getting in the way of actually photography. And it doesn't happen that often, but that's a massive, you know, negative of, of doing the YouTube thing. Misplaced priorities. Mark, have you have you ever ever thought of being a YouTuber? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just out of interest. No, I did. No, I did think, let's do a YouTube thing. I'll just do it on my iPhone. I'll have two iPhones, one to record and one to like actually take the pictures with. And I always thought I would start it off and I'd be sitting there with my dog on the bench beside me and I'd say, hello, say hello to Red. Of Red. Dogs can't take photographs. <laughs> you know, <I> mean, <laughs> I tell you what, Mark. I, I've kind of because I've I'm a lot newer to doing YouTube than these guys are, but um, I I kind of felt like I got dragged on to doing it because this is the way the kind of industry is going now. But I, I reckon you. I know we take the piss and and you're sort of laughing about it, but I reckon you wouldn't actually mind it, even if you just sort of like dip dip your toe in doing like you know one every blue moon or whatever, just. Because you've you've got a lot to say, obviously, and, and a lot of uh, you know knowledge to potentially pass on. I, I reckon you'd you'd be you'd enjoy it more. But I've certainly enjoyed it more than I thought I would, and I was probably in the same boat as you. In that, I, if someone had said to me four years ago about YouTube, I'd I'd give you that reaction the same way you did. You'd have written a blog about it, Stu. Wouldn't you? You'd have written a blog about it, mate. It, it, it wasn't just about <laughs> it wasn't just about YouTube. Um, but I, I reckon you'd enjoy it more than you think. Well, I, I, do, I do the spiels. Um, I enjoy doing the talks. Mm. You do the spiel, talk, yeah. I talk anywhere. Um, but, I mean, it, it has been in my mind before, whether or not it'd be easy to do in a, with an iPhone or whatever else. It obviously have to be in... If you're doing an iPhone, it'd have to be very good conditions, no wind or whatever for noise. Um, yeah. There wouldn't be any of these fancy drones flying above and everything else. It would just be basically fairly natural talking to camera and well, yeah. just they'd just be the same as the spiel but that's you though isn't it yeah it's yeah. got to be raw yeah. it's got to be you you know there's no yeah. point in acting something being somebody you're not that's the whole point nobody yeah. would tune yeah. in that. Well, they, get, get yourself one of these mate get yourself get yourself one of these <laughs> they're like 100 quid and, and you can then record your sound externally okay problem solved I mean the thing is um <laughs> It's the same as the spiels, really. It's just it's just the way they write the spiels, to be honest. When I started writing articles um, a few years back, and then you start to think about the grammar, you start to think about the paragraphs, and then I started doing the spiels. And I thought, I said, when I started doing the spiels, I thought, they just, just write them the way you talk. Just imagine you're down the pub, and you're just mm. having a chat, and you're having a crack. So, like, a sentence might just be, anyway, full stop, and then start again. And yeah. then and they just... Mm. Bollocks, bollocks to the grammar, bollocks to the apostrophes, bollocks to paragraphs, all that sort of thing, and just speak and write as you think. Yeah. Uh, and I think with the so the YouTube would be just would have to be just the same. Um, mm. There would well, have to be a, a thought about, but but once I'd be talking about a particular thing, as long as I've got me little pointers, and it is something I've thought about. Now I, I won't deny it. I have thought while I'm up here, and I might during the summer months. Or during quiet bits, because I think I've got I've got a workshop week after next, um, Glencoe again, and then I'm in Cowlin in January, Turd in, in February, Harris in February with Stu, um, and then I've got a few sort of group one to ones, one to twos, and things. But there's a bit of space there actually, so I might give it a dabble. Mm. Yeah. And that's like the best the, the best way of doing it as well is I, I mean I, I I find is just literally just don't even think about what you're going to say before you switch the camera on just switch the camera on and then just oh, I've never I've yeah, never talk. thought what I'm going to say <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't do that take it from me Jesus Christ you get into so much trouble I've got I've, I've got into so much trouble not thinking what I'm going to say and then loads of shit comes out and then I say the wrong thing and everyone hates me so yeah yeah just um think about what you're saying a little bit. Just, yeah, just, you just can edit it, Gary. You can edit yeah. it. It's fine. Yeah, don't, but I edit it badly as well, though. <laughs> don't, don't think about what you say. Just think about what you publish. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you're right, though, Sam. You do that, don't you? you? I remember when I first started doing it, I was always trying to prepare what I was going to say, make sure I got things in the right order, not write a script. But then the best way is just to turn it on and talk. 
just be yourself yeah. and talk. Yeah. Well, the yeah, other thing is it. is to yeah. keep it secondary to the photography, and that's the best way of keeping it secondary to the photography. Is you you focus on the photography, and then if you feel like saying something because mm. you're on your own, just just stick the camera on and say it to the camera, um, and then keep that mm. always secondary to the photography, but keep it just un- unrehearsed and and natural. Not that I'm the um, best. I think YouTuber if you go the out there with a with a if you go out there with a with a pre sort of pre thought out plan of this is what it's going to be about, it mm. usually fails. Yeah. The best thing to do is just go out, have your day, do what it is, and then afterwards think, oh, that was about that, yeah. and then edit it so it's so it's about what you were doing rather than you know oh this, today I'm going to talk about fucking I don't know leading lines or whatever. Just go out yeah. and do it, and then when you get back, think oh actually that was heavy on. I don't know, whatever. I'm going to put that. I'm going to make the video about that. And also, don't or just go and slag someone off. For <laughs> me. Also, the other thing I'd add, I'd add is don't don't be afraid just to stop. If you're if you're out one morning and and you're finding that it's a struggle to be doing a video and you've already got an intro, don't don't worry about it. Just just stop trying to film a video and just focus on photography. Yeah. It doesn't doesn't you don't you don't have to make a mm. video. There you go, Mark. You've you've had a masterclass. Yeah, some, somehow, though, I don't think Mark will will prioritise video over the photography. At all. I think I think all the time with Mark is going to be taking a picture. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm out and about. I've always got a camera in my hand. So it should be. I've always been walking the dog out this morning. It was fantastic. First light was coming up behind us uh, as we walked out from the house um, in the old Croft building uh, across from our track. Straight behind that, you had a little bit of snow uh, on the old banner store and first light hitting it, and it was just like, oh, it's fantastic. Yep, and walking walk along the road, and as you walk along a little bit further, and you go up a little bit of a brow, then you can see Sleoch just poking over the top of the hills, and then you've got all the Torridonia Mountains, Bashfin, uh, Ben Allegan, etc., all catching the first light. So, yeah, you, you carry a camera all the time. You, you know Gary lives in Peterborough, don't you? Yeah, I was going to say, not where you live, where I live, mate. No. <laughs> you, yeah. I'm you just like, yeah, yeah. 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 With, I'm with, like, with... there was there was a, a lovely a lovely bit of light over the back of McDonald's. Splinting <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. off the fantastic. pylons. Yeah. <laughs> you can get a burger whenever you want. I've got a plan ahead. I've got to drive 130 miles to get a burger. You lucky. <laughs> you, see, I'd, you see, I'd rather be me. <laughs> I don't care about the mountains. Oh, the old man of store. Don't care. They've just bought out the chicken Big Mac again. That's what I'm bothered about. <laughs> oh dear. Did we did we have a related conversation on the chat in the week about a, some some similar topic to this about handicaps? Do we, do we sort of yeah. mention that at this point? Because I thought we we oh we the were saying the... About, <laughs> well I, yes. I I put a, I put a comment on and basically called Mark a cheating landscape. Yeah, because he's got a back garden that he's just described, looking over Harris and and all the rest of it. And then Stu said that he'd got a mate that was um, suggesting that we should handicap people depending on where they live in the country. So, of course, you mean myself, shoot and... them in the kneecaps? Do you mean shoot them in the kneecaps? No, not yeah, no, do, well, Mark, Mark, chop off an arm. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. It's Mark. It's uh, Dave Fieldhouse. He, he's always saying to me that. We should, there should be some kind of universal landscape photography handicap system. Well, hmm. let's say if it's Mark or me based in the lakes or whoever, you're starting off like plus plus 10 or something. And if you're like Gary and Peterborough, you're off, I don't know, 20 handicap or something. And there's like a... <laughs> it must be more, there's like a, it must be more a, than that. There's a sliding scale for, you know, how good your picture has to be against your sort of playing handicap, if you like. Mm. It's just a... It always made me laugh, that was all. So off topic, I love the way that you two just drop names in. Just, oh, just, yeah, you know Dave Fieldhouse. No, I don't know Dave Fieldhouse. I've seen his photos, they're amazing. <laughs> I don't know him. I've got no idea who the bloke is. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not far from you, what, actually. Dave's, Dave's he's actually a very, very nice man. Lovely fella. He really is a yeah. lovely fella. Oh, he's spot on, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. he is. Uh, we'll get him on next week. I could get Dave, actually. Get Dave on. <laughs> <laughs> <Good day. laughs> 
See, <laughs> see, Jamie, I told you getting Stu on here would pay benefits eventually. Yeah, long term. So if yeah. we put up with him long enough, eventually we'll get some decent photographers on, didn't yeah. we? What did we get? 40 new subs this week because he was ranting. Yeah, so there did. you go. Exactly. Yeah. Working. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we got, we got a comment here or a question here from Alan Coles. Uh, hello, Alan. Love Alan. Great, great guy, Alan. Uh, it, this is quite long. I mean, the question's not long, but what he wrote before it's quite long. So I'm just going to read it out verbatim and, you know, we'll just deal with it from there. So over the past few days, I've watched a video where a photographer drove over two hours to capture a few images at what I would refer to as a tick-off location. Just my opinion, not an iconic location, but popular nonetheless. To achieve this image, he would have to shoot at a given time style and incorporate a fair amount of post-processing, I told you it was wrong, um, uh, to get what he wanted. Got me thinking on, would I have travelled X amount of hours for a shot that needed that sort of dedication? Expanding that thought, there are a number of iconic locations that these days hold no interest to me to shoot, even though I've never been to them. Is it because I've seen them so many, or is it because I've seen so many images from said location? I am unsure. Long-winded, but my question to you guys would be, what's your favourite... No, what's your favourite <laughs> bar of chocolate? But I'm going to... No, that's... Long-winded question, but... <laughs> Long-winded, but my question would be to you, name two what you would consider iconic locations that you have not shot and have no interest in shooting, and why? So basically, two iconic locations that you consider iconic that you have no interest in shooting... Mm. And why do you have no interest in shooting them? And if no one wants to go first, I'll go. I'll you. go first. Go on in. Go on in, Sam. That mill, the Borrowdale Mill. I don't get it. I just, I do not understand the appeal of that mill. And the second, the, the sec secret mill. Well, it's not secret. I mean, I've never been there, and I know where it is. No, secret. If you put it on a video, it's the secret. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the secret mill that if, if, yeah I, I don't i don't i don't i don't really get it and and i've seen an awful lot of shots there because there's no shortage of of shots from it and um yeah i've just it does it holds literally no appeal for me whatsoever and the other one have you I, seen any naked women there though sam <laughs> no oh god no. yeah I'll no. have to explain that one to Mark at some point. <laughs> You'll have to explain it to me at some point too. But anyway, the other the yeah. other one which I'm going to include is is actually it's going to be two locations, but they're both both the same thing, and it's for for Lone Tree. At, um, is it Buttermere? And then there's there's one which is the, the same in Wales somewhere as well. And again, just, Simpadown. I, Simpadown. I don't I don't get it. I'm sorry, um, and That's I don't. On my wall. Well, the, the thing I don't get about these places, the, the thing I don't get about these places is that it, I always get the impression that you're going to be queuing up with a whole bunch of other photographers when you go there. To, oh, okay. Yeah, that's the one. Is that the Welsh one or the, the, <laughs> shit, the Lake shit District location, one? Don't bother. Yeah, yeah, no, that's Limp Limpadan. Yeah. Yeah. No, I am. Um, Good job, Dave's done. No. <laughs> So yeah, those are, those are my two locations, and it's and it's basically just I, the thought of going somewhere to take a shot, which everyone has already photographed before, mm -hmm. and also the thought of there being a high probability that you're going to be with a whole bunch of other people there as well at the same time. It's like that that Mesa Arch in the US, where you just you're kind of lining up a bun amongst another bunch of photographers, and it's that holds literally no appeal for me whatsoever. Um, I'd rather go somewhere, not you know just bit more unique and have it to myself it's about photographing scenes it's about photographing things you see it's photographing the lights interaction with the land it's not stamp collecting um mm. and that's what known locations are. that's what you're doing when you're photographing these places you're putting a sat nav location in the car you might pass a hundred scenes that could have provided a beautiful photograph a beautiful original photograph where you use your own initiative your own individuality your own instincts to come back with something but instead you're traveling for 235.6 miles down the a7 then the m6 then whatever else uh, to get to a particular place um and all you're doing is ticking off boxes and i think that gets back to almost like the photographer who when he's picking his kit is looking at the reviews of brick walls with cameras and looking at you know the distortion and the light fall off and all that mm. sort of shite um yeah. it's not thinking about being, i mean I, I 
I, I'm a photographer who started off with a love of the landscape, if you like, and the photography was just little mementos of my walks. Um, and it's still the landscape that's the most important thing, those little views when you walk and you dog somewhere. Okay, maybe not past McDonald's and yeah. Peterborough, but it's, it's when you're out <laughs> and you're walking down the side of a canal and the first light's coming over the top of something else, there's a bit of steam rise and there's a bit of mist, whatever else, there's light coming through. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the hanging gardens of fucking Babylon. Um, it can be just about anything. And to just even think about two locations that I haven't done that I want to do, well, I, I ain't going to think of two locations because I'm not interested. Um, I'd far rather, and, and this is the same with any competition. It's like, let's reward people who see things with their eyes, but with some other f***ers' eyes, uh, and they take a picture that means something to them that everybody else perhaps can look at it and it means something to them as well. And it strikes a chord and there's an atmosphere, there's a mood, there's something. That's what photography should be about, yeah. not bloody yeah. stamp collecting, not getting a guidebook to Wales and going and taking a picture of some second tree that 3,000 people have taken that week. Um, that's my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other, the other thing yeah. I'd add to that totally is, is for, for me photography is about capturing something that's transient it's something that's happening whether that's a particular shaft of light that's coming through at a precise moment it's catching something unique that prob might not happen ever again so the moment you try and go and take a was, take a like photo being, of a set location like in his, in the way he called it because he called it transient light and i think what a great little yeah. phrase from me and cameron uh when the scottish a while back still photographs i think filmed uh does some beautiful work um and transient light what a, what a great way to say it but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with so a minute you try and replicate something that's been done a thousand times before is just you know you're not going to get that transiency in it probably mm. i'll go next um there was two there's two that come to mind one of them i think may or may not be what alan was referring to um which is those beach huts, Ozier beach huts. And I think it might have been Lee Pelling did a vlog there recently. It might have been what Alan was referring to. Lee, Good great fact, video. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I think it's a good, you know, come up with some great shots. But these beach huts apparently sit, I assume it's tidal, it must be tidal, and they're coming, the tide's coming in and out. You've got to catch it at a certain point where the tide's in, the bottom of the beach huts are therefore underwater, so you can do a lovely long exposure. There's a lot of crap in the background. So there's a massive amount of Photoshop work that you need to do to make the make the scene look quite minimal, so it's less chaotic. And yeah, you know, to be fair, you know, Lee constructed a shot, and, and it was a great shot, and you know, fair play to him. But I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have driven all those miles to try and make a shot in Photoshop, effectively, which is what it is. The subjects are still there, but everything else has been created, and there's a massive amount of work to do. And in a similar place, and Darren will probably hate me for this. I wouldn't want to go to Pin Mill, to be fair, to shoot those boats at Pin Mill, because same mm -hmm. goes for that. I think you've got some subjects there that look, you know, they're old boats. Okay, yeah, they make a nice picture. But in the background, you've apparently, I've never been there, but you've got lots of crap. You've got other stuff, distractions and stuff going on. So you're making the shop effect shot in Photoshop post. You're removing all of the distractions and leaving this nice artistic set of boats on top of each other, which the end result might look nice. But to me, it's just so much work. You know, I would rather just walk into a woodland, find a scene that nobody's ever seen before, capture something there and then that looks to me, in my eyes, a really pleasing scene and, and take that rather than have to construct a scene and remove loads of things and do the rest of it. So, yeah, to me, it's it would be a complete waste of my time to travel hours to then post-produce a scene. doesn't make sense. I, I was I was like to use the phrase... Um... Capturing a scene as opposed to creating one. Mm. Mm. And, and that's what I'd fire around yeah. do, capture something as opposed to create one. I know the, the, the huts you're talking about, and, and going back, there was a guy called Keith Agate. You know, I've not seen anything from Keith for years and years and years, but he did them huts, and I think he was in El Potty maybe 10 years ago. And since then, they've been done and gotten the book and everything else. But Keith Agate, that's a name from the past. I don't know what he's doing nowadays. <laughs> Good photographer. <laughs> if you're watching Keith, yeah. Get in touch. He did some absolutely fantastic black and white work, and a lot of people copied his work. A lot of people that are quite current 
uh, have been taking the same shots that Keith took 10 years ago. Um, and I've not seen anything mm. of him. I don't know where he went. Great photographer. I like, I must admit, I like the work. You know, there's a lot of minimalistic work that involves a lot of post process. And don't get me wrong, I think the end result looks really effective. So, but, you know, the question was about where would I not yeah, yeah. rather go and travel to do that? And, and that's just not me. That's not my style of photography, spending hours and hours post processing a shot. A bit like Mark, you know, you want to come back, you want to process a shot, get the emotion and mood into it, job done rather than spending hours on it. But, you know, the end result is still a good result to the people that put the effort into it. So fair play to them. Can I, can I just play devil's advocate here a little bit? Um, I agree with everything that's been said, and I now wouldn't travel two and a half hours to go and take that tree. Oh, well, it's actually four and a half hours to go and take that tree. But when I first started photography, you look around where you live and you can't see... You know, whether that's obviously that's going to be my issue, my lack of ability at the time, but I couldn't see images that I can see today. So I back then I I had to go to the places that were photogenic and popular to get an image that I knew that I was going to be happy with. So so I can kind of understand why people do these tick off exercises and go and take the photos because they're just looking for something they want to, they want to have something they're proud of yeah when you first start like nowadays i don't you know i've, I've just done you know i'm, I'm doing a i'm well i'll talk about that another day but i'm setting up a new channel that's basically just gonna be about local landscapes and just stuff that's that, that's local to you but i would the places that i shoot now i never would have shot five years ago because mm. i wasn't good enough to see it perhaps mm. Mm. and <clears throat> You know, and also the, these places that everyone else was shooting, so the Lone Tree at, at Klimpadan and the Roaches and, I don't know, all these places, I was inspired to go there because I knew I was going to get a photograph there. So I think it's kind of for a lot of people, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, it's kind of their uh, initiation into photography. It's like a rite of passage that you go through to then realise you don't have to go to those places to take those shots, for me. Mm. That's how I yeah, think. and, 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 and also, listen, you, you know, know, yeah, go on. I was going to say, Alan, Alan's question was to us, though. To be fair, he asked us our, yeah. our, our yeah. places, but you're right. Yeah. You know, there's 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 people that are starting out that will look into a guidebook and they'll use that guidebook as their bible to try and go and capture some landscape yeah. shots that they're yeah. going to come back and be happy with. And there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. You know, everybody's done that, yeah. and we've all gone through that phase. But the question was at us, yeah. I guess, wasn't it? What do we feel? And yeah. we're we're. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, now for me, I, I there's, I mean, somewhere I tell you, there's somewhere that I would never go, and, I, and even back then I would never have gone. I've got no idea why people are interested in it, and that's Shingle Street, in in mm. wherever it is in Suffolk. It's like seriously, it's just a piece of, it's just a load of gravel, <laughs> a load of gravel, a bit of tide, and a stupid house. No, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm all right, thanks very much. Because like, if the sky is spectacular. Oh, brilliant. But you don't know if you're going to rock up there and the sky is spectacular. And if it's not, you just, oh, oh, do you know what I'm going to do? The sky is crap. I'm going to shoot black and white. I'm going to shoot some black and white gravel. <laughs> brilliant. Um, <laughs> other than that, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, probably I was going to say a lone tree at Buttermere because it's like a twig. It's a twig it? now, yeah. Twig now. Yeah, so... Probably that. Probably that as well. I probably, I probably wouldn't. I wouldn't shoot the lone the lone twig uh, uh, at Um But I do understand why people do it initially. I, I do, and you know, I wouldn't do it now. You know, I don't. I have no. I have no compulsion to go to any of the places I used to go to to get shots. I'd rather find my own shots. But when you first start, I can kind of see it. Oh yeah, Stuart. Well, mm. Oh, go on. Sorry, Sam. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say as as well. I remember Mads. Peter Iverson doing a video about this as well. I iconic locations when you're first starting can be quite useful for understanding composition and why those compositions work as well. Um, so there is there is a good argument for that when you're starting to, mm. to visit these places. Yeah. But probably if you were starting again, if, if you were starting again, here's a question, if you were starting again, knowing what you know now, would you have gone to those iconic locations or would you have said, actually, do you know what? I'm better off learning my trade in the little local patches, I well, I probably would anyway because it's. I mean, I I 
I haven't been to many iconic she locations. In Scotland, mate. That's why. <laughs> 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 but like, I, so for instance, Ice, Iceland is. Oh, sorry, I'm over, oh, taking over as well again here. But Iceland is another good example. Mm-hmm. When I went to Iceland, it was pretty early on in my. I'd been doing photography for about a year when I went to Iceland, and there were locations I really wanted to go to. One of which was definitely not Kirkjufell because it had been done too often. I had no no desire to go there. But there were places I wanted to go to. I wanted to go to the Diamond Beach. Wanted to go to. Uh, Vesterhorn. Uh, so yeah, I, absolutely. I, I would, I would do the same again when I, when I, when I, if I was starting off now. Yeah. Mm. Stuart, sorry. Stuart, two places. <laughs> two places quickly. Um, no, no, you've got. Some no, no, I've got, I've got two, two. Well, the two that irk me the most probably, Durdle Door, would be one of them. I look at pictures of Durdle. Yeah, I look at pictures of it and I'm just like, like some clay, like, like honey pot cliche locations, there's a good amount of them you, you can look at and go, oh yeah, I can see why people find that attractive. Like the, the wheat falls at, um, underneath the buckle, you know, everything kind of fits together and it's nice. But I look at stuff like Durdle Door, I'm like, oh. not so struck on that. And then, um, I think someone mentioned it before, that Meser Arch in, um, in the states i look at that thing and every time i see a picture of it i'm just like i i cannot for the life of me see see the appeal in just a big honking gray bit of rock with a slit in it i'm just like you know i just don't see anything remarkable in that at all yeah the sun comes up and you can get a shot of it in the gap i'm like it's it's ugly like objectively quite ugly (laughs) i look at it and i think why the hell is everyone lining up to to take this shot, so uh, so yeah, the Meserat one I find really sort of odd. Um, you know the the worst bit about Durdle Door, yeah, it's like that. It's like that. Yeah, walking down it, it's like that. Getting back up, it's it's unbelievably <laughs> steep. Seriously, I had to stop about four <laughs> times coming back. Up. I was absolutely <laughs> shagged getting back up Durdle Door. And the same morning, I'd done Corf Castle, which is like that. <laughs> oh, honestly, oh God, what was I thinking? Yeah. I thought it's another one, though, isn't it? It's another one. Yeah. That, you know, you go to, if you go to Corf Castle, like when I went, and there's no mist, it's you, you're knackered, aren't you? There's not, there's yeah, not shots. It's awful. There. It's yeah, it's just. It's well, what you away. what you were <laughs> saying before about um, like developing and stuff, I was going to say a lot of that, so you kind of covered it. But it's interesting watching some quite experienced photographers who sort of like to sort of put themselves out there as being very skilled and whatever. And they still, when you actually look at their work, they've not, they've not really progressed that past that point of just going and still box ticking. You can, you can learn all the post-processing skills and compositional skills and still go and take a really nice technically proficient shot of those places, but it's still in, it's still a box tick. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter how, good you get at those other things you're still ticking boxes and a lot of people never never really move on from that they still get stuck in that like mark made a good point about um love of the landscape i you know he probably sees it the same way i do in that you get a lot of people on workshops where you can tell that there's not really a love of the landscape it's more about just taking a pretty picture i'm not quite sure they're actually inspired by the landscape do you know what i mean if i if i didn't take photos i'd still go out and walk up the fells and whatever because because i like being in that environment I, with these people who do the box ticking i don't the photography is just the vehicle to whatever enjoyment it is i don't, I don't really see any connection with the landscape sometimes but there was a, a light bulb moment for me, and I think this is what took my photography on from where it was to where it is now. And it was a few years ago, and it was it was a, it was suddenly like I I all if you go back and look at my don't go back and look at my early videos, but if you were to go back and look at my early videos, they're all they're all like like you know you you were just talking there, Durdle Door. That's like video number seven or something. Right. Klimpadan is video like number 12 or something, yeah. you know, like uh, I went to Dungeness for video number one and the Roaches. For, well, they're all iconic sort of t- box ticking locations. Mm. And I got to somewhere, I think it was Cromer with you, Jamie. Mm. I think it was there. And I'd been to London. Uh, I'd been to a Tate 
to do some street photography and I ended up in the Tate. And I took a shot, a particular shot, and I just went, I've, I've captured the emotion. I've captured the emotion of that moment. Mm. It was just it was just a black and white shot of a girl leaning up against a, leaning up, sitting up against a pole, looking at something. And then from then on, I was like, photography is about emotion. It's about capturing an emotion or evoking an emotion when you look at the picture. Mm. And from then on, everything changed. All of my photography changed from going to places that, that oh, that looks lovely, that looks lovely, to trying to, to do something with my photography. And, you know, so it's a process where you carry on doing it. It doesn't just, you know, you don't just go, oh, I've got it, I've, I've mastered it. But all of a sudden, it was more about capturing something rather than just taking the shot of the, what's in front of you. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 It is, it is interesting what you know what you just said, what both of you said about the love of the landscape and about the emotion and things. Because if you haven't ever had that connection with the landscape or the great outdoors generally, if you've not, if you haven't got a love of being outside, <clears throat> at, no matter what time of day, no matter what, what weathers, then you're never going to be motivated to take a picture of it. You know, and then it does become, as you say, a very technical process of actually constructing a picture to create a picture that looks nice rather than there's nothing of you in it it's very stale it's very cold you know what I mean and you know I was born on my own well on my own I, I, I was I was an only child sure in, someone else was there somebody else was involved <laughs> yeah my, my, my parents happened to be there yeah but, but I was an only child I was in the middle of literally nowhere you know we lived in, on this farm and I spent my early years up until my teens every single day out in the land doing things, you know, whether it was helping my dad on the land or just messing around with my mates in fields and jump, jumping dykes and, you know, just... just Count, Counting to 12. Counting to 12. Yeah, yeah, all that. Yeah, could do that on both hands. Um, and, and I think that, that inbred love of just being outside <laughs> and just... just in... <laughs> what? <laughs> Inbred love. Okay, got you. Time got in. you. Time in, Jamie. So I was a bit slow on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's getting back to that. I've always said, if you don't feel any emotion for your subject, how can your viewers feel any emotion for the pictures that you produce? Yeah. You know? Yeah. If yeah. you don't feel any emotion, you know, I, I can't see what the point is. Um, you might as well be, oh, freaking hell, playing golf. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it's you know you've, you've got to feel some emotion for your subject it's what, what you said before Gary when you capture in the moment and, and you felt emotion for that scene so that comes through in the picture you know if you're approaching it yeah, in, exactly. I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at this I'm, uh, it's a rule of, rule of thirds I'm looking at me leading lines I'm looking at me exposure I'm doing this I'm doing that and yeah you've got to be precise I mean I always think you, you see with the heart and you shoot with the head basically. But the heart's got to be in there. There's got to be some emotion. It can't just mm. be ticking boxes. Um, yeah. You know, there's got to be emotion. If there's no emotion, then it's pointless. I love the fact of sitting here talking about this as if I know what I'm talking about with Mark Littlejohn <laughs> and Stuart McLennan. It's like ridiculous, isn't it? Isn't it ridiculous? But like I'm trying to I'm trying to say that I know what I'm talking about with you two sat here. I might as well. I mean, if we'd have... If, seriously, hang if we'd hang have on, Gary. What are you saying about me and Jamie? Food, oh, I'm in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying, I'm down saying down you normal, guys Sam. are not as good as these two. That's what I'm saying. What's, 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 what's the difference of... But me being here, it doesn't matter. No, it right. doesn't matter. You're an award winner, mate. That's what it is. It's so, it's so stupid. Do with with likes and social media, or with how the pictures are perceived, or or having a photograph that was liked one year in, in El Potty. Uh, it's about having a love of your subject, and I think everybody, yeah, totally equal in that aspect. It doesn't matter how many likes we've got, or, or if we won an award, or anything else. It's about what we feel for our subject and how how we feel when we take those photographs and how those photographs make us feel, you know, yeah, it, true. We're, we're, we're sitting here as five complete and utter equals because oh, we all absolutely. love what we do. Suits me. Suits <laughs> me. I agree. Totally agree. I am definitely your equal. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that 100% now. You heard it here. You heard it on the podcast. I am Mark Littlejohn's equal, just so you know. No, no, I totally, no, I totally, I totally get what you're saying. I do. I totally get what you're saying. It, it is, it's, it, you've got to feel, you've got to feel something. Otherwise, what are you doing it for? Yeah. What are you doing it for if you don't feel it, you know? Mm. It's just, like you say, it's just a box ticking exercise. Like you might as well, you might as well just let AI do it for you and then just look at the photos afterwards. Yeah, but here, we're saying this. You'd be amazed how many people I've seen come and go out of photography because for that very reason that they clearly do not feel anything. Do you know what I mean? The, the photography is literally just the vehicle to get likes on social media or some sort of validation or whatever it is. And they, they could be doing photography. They could be doing bloody tiddlywinks. Yeah. It wouldn't. It wouldn't matter. It's just that's the mechanism to to get to the, that end result. And I've seen so many people who started up photography and then drop it after two or three years because they realise that once you go through that process of just doing the box ticking, and actually to develop and and grow as a photographer, there's actually a lot of hard work involved in that. You have to to learn how to see. A lot of people don't want to do that. The big thing. Oh, this is too hard, you know what I mean? And, and yeah. you know, you've got you've got to have that well, motivation. That's why you've got people on YouTube all the time going, This is the secret tip, this is the thing that you need to do. Because they're catering for those people who want the fast track oh, yeah. to get what they think is everyone else is gonna like. And actually there's no there's no fast no. track. The secret the secret to good photography is to take lots of photos and to go out and do it because you love it. That's the secret. But no one wants to hear that. You don't want to hear that if you just start photography. You want to hear, oh, it's it's a this setting on your camera or it's doing this particular thing or it's doing that. But it, it isn't. There's none of that. But people will sell that the same way that they'll, you know, that they would sell the best way to flick a tiddlywink. It's yeah. just that's what people want to hear. But yeah. we here, all of us here, I think, you know, regardless of, Regardless of how technically, how good we are, how good our photos are, we're all here because we love photography. Yeah. And we love that the outdoors and we love that feeling. Yeah. And that's what really matters. It's, you know, we've won the competition without entering. You can just have that. Very good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can have that. Just, just out of interest, Stu and Mark, the, the people that come on your workshops, they obviously don't come on the workshops to, to learn how to use a camera. I presume they know how to do that. But what, yeah. what are they looking for? Are they looking for you to take them to a place, or are they, what are they looking to actually learn from you guys? You go first, Marco. It's 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 intriguing. Um, I think people come um, just to see how you see what you see. Uh, they usually come with me, I think, because I don't go to well-known places. I might go to lovely places, but we don't go to honeypot locations. We don't. Um, I very much follow my nose. Um, even on a day, I look at the weather forecast, I look at the skies. When I'm deciding where I'm going to go next, I'm looking at the skies, I'm looking at the conditions. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in um, that people take the best photographs when they're relaxed, when they're smiling, when they're happy. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles, I think, to people taking a photograph is like for Gary, when he, when he leaves Peterborough, when he might get a day free. He puts pressure on himself as soon as he leaves his home, as soon as he's heading somewhere, because even without wishing to put pressure on himself, he's thinking, I've got a day away. I'm going to Wales. I'm going somewhere else. I want to get a result. I want to... Yeah. You put pressure yeah, yeah, on yourself yeah. to come back with a yeah, shot yeah. because you're not... Yeah. I'm lucky. I live with great views. I'm out almost every day. Um, so the first thing I really do with a group is, is ensure that they relax ensure they're going to have a nice time, ensure that there's no pressure on them uh, to get a result, and just to really fall in love with the land, in love with the landscape, and to see the things I see and how I see them. And really, it, it, it's very untechnically minded. Um, it's really about having a good time, appreciating the landscape, appreciating the little things I say about, you know, see with the heart, shoot with the head. Uh, you don't have to show everybody everything all the time. These sorts of little things, it's really about little reminders, little aid memoirs that I, I might say. So it's nothing about 
keep this on that line, keep that in there, have a look at this rule of third, this leading line and whatever else. It's not really anything about that. It's just about relaxing, working out exactly how best to take the picture that first catches our eye. Um, simple as that. And have a nice time. Have a good time. At the end of the day, people, if people have come in with me, I mean, I don't charge. I mean, some, some prices you see for workshops these days are, are horrendous, but typically for for five days, four nights away with me in a really nice house with all the catering done uh, is about 1,500 quid. Um, but that's your holiday. You know, it's a lot of money for, for a lot of people. So it's really about making sure that you have a good time and you smile a lot of the time when you're out with me. Even if that's just it made me fucking stupid because I've forgotten where to put my camera. <laughs> I mean, I, I, can't, I can't really um, really add a lot to that, to be honest. What, what I would say, though, to that is that I think people, that, those things that Mark's on about, they're absolutely vital. You know, you need, you need people to relax and you need people to, to find their own voice with making their images because I do think you, you get a lot of people coming on workshops that perhaps have an idea that you're going to take them to a spot and just almost give them a, a smoking gun to, to get great pictures. And it, it just doesn't work like that. You can't do that in a day. I mean, a group workshop's a different thing because you've got multiple days to sort of go over things. But on day workshops, you, I've found in the past that um, that you do get some people that they kind of, they just want to get a great picture out of the workshop. And that's never really what it should be about. You should be about taking the learning away from the workshop and then you can apply it in your own photography when you get great conditions. It should never be about coming on a workshop just trying to get a great picture because, again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying before about having a love of the landscape. If, you, if you're coming on a workshop with the mindset of just getting a great picture, then you, you're really not learning anything, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah a lot of what Mark's saying there is true, but it's, I think, um, as I say, it's people have this idea that there's a there's a, a set of steps that you need to follow to get to this uh, point it's it's not yeah, that at all you know it's, it's... I, I did remember oh, years ago and it was a couple of folk from a camera club and it was like i had to say to them so look there isn't a mathematical algorithm that we can apply to obtain yeah. a good photograph you know it's about what i said before about the three eyes individuality initiative instinct um and working out you know what it is that you love, and then how best to photograph it. Simple as that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, make it fun. Good, mm -hmm. good, summary. good stuff. Have fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think I think on that I think we're we're I think we're good. Mm. Yeah. I mean it's yeah uh, brilliant brilliant having you, Mark. Fantastic. Just remember, everyone, me and Mark are equals. He said so. <laughs> um, br br brilliant having you on. Um, please come back at some point. Would you Would you come back at some point? No problem. Just give us a show. I'll come on any time. Oh, brilliant. I thought he was going to say no. <laughs> He's got a whiskey. He's all right. Yeah. Oh, we mate, we'd love to have you back on. That was that was a fantastic chat. And um, yeah, I mean, look seriously, if you you must know who Mark is, little Johnny, you know, you must know. But if you don't. Well, I'll put a link in the comments. Check out his work. It's unbelievable. Even the stuff you do with your iPhone when you're out on your dog walks is is like, really? You really? Really? Come on. Like, come on. Snapseed. It's you, all snapseed. You really, you really <laughs> took that? Come on. Look, I'm looking. No, it's, I mean, if, if you want to check it, I, I only really, well, I use Twitter and Facebook, but I don't use Instagram really anymore because I can't, yeah. my spills are too long. You know, do a spiel and I, and I, and I pace it in. They said, no, it's too long. So remove a sentence, no, it's too long. Move another sentence, no, it's too long. Move another sentence. It's like, well, I've missed the point now. Um, so, <laughs> but I am I am updating the website for the first time since 2016. So, yeah. And obviously you'll you'll see Mark vlogging before long as well. Yeah, you heard it tonight. First yeah. We did talk him into it. Just, so, just, just, yeah. Next week I've got the dog tuned up. He's ready. Brilliant! Plenty <laughs> of shots of the dog. Seventy percent dog, thirty percent photos. You'll be fine. Yeah. Just yeah. Hang, so, hang, but, hang a road mic from his from his neck. He'll be fine. He'll be yapping yeah, away. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. exactly. You'll be fine. Put GoPro on him. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, uh, Mark. Br brilliant having you. Really, really brilliant. And thank you to you guys. And, uh, you know, as always, next week we should be back to full complement with uh, Dave and Darren. Um, so get ready for some, you know, would you rather have a penis for an arm or a, <laughs> a for a leg, conversation or whatever it is. Um, and you can all, you know, we'll, have, we'll carry on the conversation about Darren's chair unless he's changed it. Um, but thank you so much for watching uh, and yeah, get your competition entries in, by the way. Mm. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye. See Bye. you. Cheers. <laughs>